no further introductions. It's therefore time for question period. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, Victoria Vignew posted a moving video this week about her struggle. She has cystic fibrosis, and Victoria needs or can be. Mr. Speaker, why won't this government fund the medicine Victoria needs? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course. Uh, uh, we empathize with those patients with cystic fibrosis, and we know that they, they and their families certainly struggle with the debilitating effects of this disease. And uh, we know that they hope that each new drug that may be available uh, could be promising for their particular case. So we certainly empathize with these families and these individuals, and we are committed to finding solutions. But of course, we have taken the politics out of drug funding. Yeah. We rely on experts to determine which drugs are funded, and we rely on the best medical evidence available. So as with all new drugs, we need to know how it will provide patients with better health outcomes. We need to study potential side effects that could be harmful, and we therefore rely on experts and on the best medical advice available to determine which drugs are funded. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, thank you. Back to the minister. Victoria said the Premier won't take a meeting. She has also said the Premier won't take a call. She has also said the Premier won't even answer her emails. Unbelievable. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier ignoring Victoria and the life-saving medication she needs? Why? Minister. Well, as I have said, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have taken the politics out of uh, this particular area when we're dealing with new drugs uh, and uh, their potential to help uh, Ontarians. So we do know that Orcambi will be reviewed again under the National Common Drug Review Process in the coming months. I've been assured that this will happen in July to see if the experts find enough evidence of clinical effectiveness to recommend it for public funding. And so, in the meantime, uh, we will continue to provide uh, the care that individuals need to provide cystic fibrosis patients with the current best available treatments, because we know that that kind of care has been shown to improve their condition and their quality of life. So as I have uh, said, all drugs go through a pan-Canadian expert commi committee, which undertakes a thorough evaluation based on the best available evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. Final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Pan Canadian uh, uh, Review Committee has dropped the ball and has created such a bureaucratic process that kids cannot access the medications they need, life-saving medications. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Why is the premier letting Victoria suffer and fight for every breath she takes? As Jerry Agar has said today, is the premier okay with letting Victoria die? Minister. I would like to emphasize that we care for all Ontarians and provide the best available health care in this province. The, the fact of the matter is the Canadian Drug Expert Committee did review Orcambi in 2016 for patients aged 12 years and older, and the review raised concerns about Orcambi's lack of clinical effectiveness, so the drug was not recommended for public funding. We know countries such as England, Scotland and Australia also do not provide public coverage for this drug. The manufacturer was encouraged to resubmit or can be to the common drug review if they had new evidence of clinical effectiveness. And we know that they did make a resubmission to the CDR in February, and the Canadian Drug Expert Committee will be reviewing it again in July. We're constantly working to fund more evidence-based medicines. And so we have, uh, through the years, included uh, as an example, yes, Kaleidico, a life-saving cystic fibrosis drug. This was an example where we took the politics out of this process Thank you. and approved a drug. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. Both the Auditor General and the Financial Accountability Officer have released reports in the past weeks showing the Liberal government has misrepresented the true strength of the province's finances, and they aren't quibbling over pennies. The Financial Accountability Officer uh, Excuse me. 
I'm going to ask the member to really kind of guard her words uh, on what she's saying, and she was borderline unparliamentary, and if it comes again, I'm going to ask her to withdraw. And we aren't quibbling over pennies, Speaker. The Financial Accountability Officer is reporting the 2018 deficit to be more than $12 billion. Wow. That's twice what the Finance Minister is projecting. Wow. The Liberal government has called this an accounting dispute. I believe the Auditor and the Financial Accountability Officer. When will the government come clean and amend their deficit forecast to, for 2018? Good Thank you. Speaker, the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. I also appreciate the work done by the FAO and the Auditor General. They have both reaffirmed that we have taken a very cautious and reasonable approach in our assumptions going forward. The FAO has reinforced and reinforced that some of the progressive measures that we put on will have a profound positive impact on our society as well. The Auditor General has cited two issues, and the FAO has assumed them in his estimates going forward. Both of these two issues, which are the pension assets uh, that are jointly sponsored by the government, as well as the Fair Hydro Plan that enables us to reduce rates by 25 percent on the ratepayer base, um, are being disputed uh, by the auditor and professional accountants, both internally and externally. We recognize that dispute, but we're not going to weigh into it. What we're going to do is continue to foster investments Answer. that grow our economy and support the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. What is the point of having an Auditor General and a Financial Accountability Officer if you don't listen to them? When the Liberal government came to power in 2003, Ontario's debt was $139 billion. In less than 15 years, we've watched Ontario's debt balloon to over $300 billion. If we stay on the Liberal path of deficit spending, Ontario's debt to GDP, already at 40 per cent, will exceed 45 per cent, twice Bob Ray's legacy. Oh. Again, I ask the minister, will you finally admit that the Auditor General and the Financial Accountability Officer are right and amend your financial numbers to reflect this year's deficit will be over $12 billion? Thank you. I would like the member from Guelph to relax. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the member opposite is now disputing the integrity of our civil service and professional accounts internally that have signed off on these measures. The member is now also disputing uh, the chair of the Canadian Standards on Accounting Principles that has also provided an opinion on the matter, saying that the very pension assets that the auditor is now disputing is the very same assets that she audited and approved only years ago and happened for the past 20 years, even when uh, the Conservatives were in power. Furthermore, the issues around the Fair Hydro Plan, around rate regulated accounting, is in fact uh, permissible even today in this government in other areas, as well as other parts of Canada and the United States. So we have taken their advice, we've made a policy decision to provide supports for the people of Ontario, and we've been very open and disclosed. In fact, investors around the world are investing in these very measures. Yeah. Uh, o OPG, which Answer. cites that debt very clearly on their books, is has a clean audit and it's approved by our auditor as well, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Nothing is hidden. We're just proceeding as necessary. Thank you. Final supplementary. Spin it all you want, Minister. The Financial Accountability Officer and the Auditor General don't believe you, and neither do we. The FAO report said that the government spending plan will add $70 billion to the province's net debt, increasing it to almost $400 billion in 2021. Unbelievable. FAO chief economist David West said as a ba at a basic level, the government's current spending levels are unsustainable. Unsustainable. But that's not the only word people have used to describe the books. Deterioration, dangerous precedents, unlikely assumptions, unreliable, distorted, bogus. That's just a small selection of the words used. That is your legacy. Do the right thing. Update your deficit numbers to reflect the $12 billion deficit. Thank you, Mr. Here's our legacy, Mr. Speaker. We lead Canada, Europe, and the United States in economic growth. We balance the budget. We have a $600 million surplus, the lowest unemployment in two decades. We have the top destination for foreign direct investment, and Canada is doing well. And our public accounts, which is the actual results of the year, have proven that we balance the budget and have a surplus, Mr. Speaker. And DVRS and Moody's have affirmed our AA rating, and DVRS says it's stable, Mr. Speaker. And the FAO has made projections every year 
and each time this government exceeded targets and we are now doing better than we've ever done and we're continuing to make it more affordable for the people of Ontario. Here, here. You see it, please? You see it, please? Okay, the member from Simcoe Gray and the President of the Treasury Board are warned. I know. Thank you. New question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. The Ontario government used to fund 50 per cent of transit net operating costs in a successful funding formula that ensured high quality service. This funding was cut by the Conservatives and it stayed cut under the Liberals. Municipalities and transit advocates like TTC riders have repeatedly asked for this funding to be restored. Why has the Premier repeatedly refused? Thank you. Speaker, Minister of Economic Development and Growth on behalf of Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Minister. Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I know he and others in the NDP caucus have raised this a number of times over the last couple of years. What they fail to comprehend in the way they ask their question, Speaker, is though that this government is investing more in public transit infrastructure in the City of Toronto and across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and in every community across Ontario that has public transit more so than any other government in Ontario history, Speaker. And in fact, uh, just a number of uh, months ago, we started to double uh, the amount of gas tax money wow. that uh, the communities that are supporting public transit themselves locally receive, Speaker, uh, over the next couple of years, that gas tax funding to specifically double. support expanding public transit and support public transit service in those communities will double, Speaker. This is a significant step forward with respect to supporting those communities and their transit needs, while at the same time, Speaker, answer. we continue to invest in the infrastructure, and I'll be delighted to provide more details on that in the follow-up answers. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you'd, you'd think, Speaker, from that response that everything is dealt with. Oh, yeah. But in fact, subways in Toronto are filled to crush capacity. That's right. Bus routes have been cut, and service on remaining routes keeps getting less frequent and reliable. Meanwhile, fares are going up while services are getting to be worse. No wonder so many people think that their only option is the car. But the Premier has the ability to change this. She can restore the province's traditional 50 per cent funding for net transit operating costs and improve service not in 10 or 20 years, but today. Why won't she? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, as I, as I mentioned in my, my initial answer to the, uh, to the first question that came from the NDP caucus on this, here are just some of the things that our government's invested in, specifically in the 416, specifically in Toronto as it relates to public transit. So, for example, $3.7 billion for GO Regional Express Rail here in Toronto alone, which will help to support and enable Smart Track. $5.3 billion to build the Eglinton Crosstown wow. LRT, single largest wow. public transit project wow. in Ontario history. Wow. Almost $2 billion to continue to expand rapid transit in wonderful Scarborough Speaker. Wow. $974 million from the Move Ontario Trust for the Toronto York Spadina subway extension, which opened in Vaughan last December, Speaker. $456 million to build out the Union Pearson Express, and specifically to the gas tax funding I alluded to earlier, $2.1 billion since 2004 for the City of Toronto alone to help support transit operations, Speaker. Answer. And I look forward to talking about more of the good news we've delivered to the people of Toronto for transit in the final answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Acting Premier. That answer is why people are so cynical about public transit. The Premier will run publicly funded ads boasting about how much he cares about transit riders. Oh, yeah. But on the buses, on the subways, and on the streetcars, transit riders know the truth. Service has gotten worse while fares have become more expensive. The Premier can change this. She can restore public confidence in transit. She can improve transit service today. She can restore provincial funding for transit operations as the NDP has committed. Why won't she? Thank you. Minister. 
Well, speaker, I, I mentioned a second ago that there's more. So, for example, here in the city of Toronto, our government investing $416 million wow. to support the purchase of brand new streetcars. Wow. Starting in early 2019, right. Speaker, all Go Transit all trips together. within Toronto specifically will only cost Presto Card users $3 per trip, wow. Speaker. Which means, which means, for the very people the member from Toronto Danforth pretends to represent and speak for, we're making their transit more affordable. That's what our government's doing, Speaker. And just this morning, just this morning, maybe the member didn't know this, the Premier and the Minister of Transportation joined with Mayor Tory and others to sign an MOU to commit provincial funding to the downtown relief line, to the Young North subway extension, to more transit in Scarborough, Speaker, to the waterfront LRT. That's what our government's doing while you're busy talking. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start the clock. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the acting premier. The NDP hears frequently from Ontario families who are concerned about long-term care. Even frontline health care workers have also been sounding alarm bells. They work hard every day to take care of residents, but when you're short-staffed, you just can't do it all. We learned today that the families of two patients have filed class action claims against two private for-profit long-term care providers. The claims are horrendous. Bed sores so deep that bone was exposed, maggots crawling inside untreated skin wounds. How is it possible that such things are happening to our seniors in Ontario? Acting Premier. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, I, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to ensure the families and individuals living in long term care facilities that I, as the Minister of Health and Long Term Care, our government, takes the responsibility to ensure residents in each and every long term care home are safe and that they're living securely with dignity uh, and uh, getting the type of care that they deserve. Uh, clearly, I cannot comment on uh, uh, the uh, issues of uh, various legal matters their cases before the courts, but uh, our government, I think, has demonstrated our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being through a very rigorous inspection system and regulatory framework that we are continuously working to improve. Uh, currently, as I'm sure every member knows, we have a very strong inspection system. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. This is not a one-off scenario. The, these problems are pervasive, said the lawyer leading both lawsuits. We are alleging that there is a systemic negligence going on, that there is failure to deliver the kind of care that has been promised, she said. Systemic negligence. Just imagine how it must feel for an Ontario family to entrust their elderly mothers, fathers, or grandparents to a long-term care system with such pervasive problems. Why has the Premier and this Liberal government stubbornly refused to conduct a full commission of, of inquiry into long-term care as the NDP has repeatedly proposed? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have increased our oversight through the Strengthening Quality and Accountability for Patients Act. It was passed last December to ensure all operators are addressing concerns promptly. This includes new enforcement tools, surprise inspections. Uh, there are financial penalties that we've introduced and even provincial offences for operators who repeatedly do not comply with the requirements of the Act. We've also introduced a website. It's very easily accessible. I've certainly uh, consulted it myself, where you can look up on each and every home here in Ontario, each long-term care home, their performance, results of inspections, and so uh, families can, uh, and individuals can ensure themselves of uh, yes, the sir. safety that they will receive from a particular home. Uh, I will have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. Thank Final you, supplementary. We also learned today that an 88-year-old Hamilton mother who was badly injured at her long-term care home, and, this, and there is speculation it may have been as a result of an assault. Her daughter found her with a black eye and later a goose egg on her forehead and bruises down her body. The daughter said, if a child had those injuries, 
something would be done immediately. But because people in those nursing homes are old, no one fights for their protection. That was her quote. When will this government protect seniors and conduct a full commission of inquiry into long-term care so we can find and fix the problems in long-term care and look after our seniors? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we have every confidence that we have an inspection system that is working well, that is uh, working to uh, improve our system, work with operators across the province. But we know that there is more to do because as uh, our population is aging and living with even more complex uh, conditions, uh, the needs are increasingly complex. And so this is why in our 2018 budget we're investing three hundred million dollars over three years to increase staffing in long-term care homes. This means that every long-term care home, all 628 in this province, will benefit from an additional registered nurse. It will ensure that every home in the province has staff with specialized training in behavioral supports for residents with cognitive impairments. It means an additional 15 million hours of nursing, personal support and therapeutic care for our loved ones living in long-term care. We will continue Answer. with our program ensuring our seniors are living in safety and security in long-term care homes in this province. Thank, Thank you. you. Your question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the Liberals' disastrous energy policy has forced many Ontarians to make a choice between heating and eating. Skyrocketing energy bills have put them in a most precarious position. The Liberals' answer was to ban winter disconnections, which oh. amounts to no more than a stay of execution. But winter is over, Speaker, and we find that thousands are now facing disconnections this spring. If hundreds of struggling families in Sudbury and thousands across Ontario couldn't afford to pay their hydro bills in the winter, what makes the government think they will be able to pay the bill plus the arrears in the spring? What is the Acting Premier saying to those families now that the wolf is at the door? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, last winter, as you know, our government passed legislation that granted the province's independent energy regulator the power to end all winter disconnections and protect Ontarians because no one, Speaker, should ever be put at risk of disconnection in the winter. Our priority is to make sure families and businesses have access to clean, reliable, and affordable electricity. Speaker, while the ban of winter disconnections uh, ended on April the 30th, there are a number of government programs designed to help reduce the cost of electri electri electricity bills for vulnerable consumers. We encourage all cons customers to contact the local utility about qualifying for programs that are in place to help. For example, Speaker, our government expanded the electricity support programs, such as the Ontario Electricity Support Program and the Rural and Remote Rate Protection Plan, which provides support to low-income customers and those customers with the highest delivery rates. These customer speakers are seeing savings of yes, up sir. 40 to 50 percent off their electricity bills. Speaker, they are, these are important programs that are available in addition Thank to 25 percent off of a fair hydro plan. Supplementary. Speaker, it is the disastrous energy policies of this government that led to the skyrocketing hydro prices and the skyrocketing number of people that were subject to winter disconnections in the first place. They had to act because of their mistakes in the energy policy, signing exorbitant contracts under the Green Energy Act with Liberal friends that the Auditor General herself said were far in excess of the market value for electricity. What, why, why would the Liberals now suggest that someone who cannot pay their bill in January can pay it in May, including arrears. Speaker, won't the acting premier simply admit that their energies have been a disaster in this problem in this province, and that their government is not fit for re-election? Thank you. Uh, speaker, we have worked extremely hard to develop an electric system that is clean accessible and reliable speaker and Ontarians should be very proud that in our province we do not uh, burn dirty coal to produce electricity like the way conservatives used to do and actually ran again and again to continue to uh, continue uh, to burn 
dirty coal, Speaker. That is bad for our health. It's bad for our environment. Speaker, we have taken steps to ensure that our electric system is clean. But, Speaker, we have not stopped there. We have also made uh, ensure that there is a 25 percent reduction in all electricity bills Answer. across the province. What was the response of the of the Conservatives? They voted against that program. When we introduced programs like Thank Ontario Electric Support Program, they voted against that program as well, Speaker. Thank you. I let that one go. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question will be for the Minister of Children and Youth. Minister, my office has been approached by many parents, including Mrs. Julia Ritchie and her little girl June. June was diagnosed with severe autism in October of 2017, when she was 30 months old. She has been on the wait list for treatment since that date. The family was originally told that it would take about six months. Well, the six months have come and gone, and they are now facing a 2.5 to three year long wait list. Can the minister explain where children with autism in Sudbury and Nickel Belt can find the faster, more effective autism services this government promised over two years ago. Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, the member knows um, that this government has invested more money into autism services than any government in this country. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I would say that. We've invested more resources than any government in North America. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that our contribution to autism is actually creating more space. 16,000 more spaces will be created uh, in Ontario over the next few years, and we are seeing change. I went to the opening of Erin Oaks and I spoke to parents specifically about the changes that are taking place, and I met a young, a young family there, the young girl who got into a program a year ago and was nonverbal, and because of the program, now she is speaking. We're seeing the changes on the ground. Mr. Speaker, it's the NDP that has said that they would rip up the entire program if they were put into position of power. Thank you. Speaker, we don't see on the ground any evidence of those investments in uh, Nickel Belt or Sudbury. The kids are still waiting a very long time. Mrs. Ritchie could not wait the 18 months for an assessment, so the family paid privately in the home in the hope that June would be seen faster. The Child and Community Resource in Sudbury is presently admitting children into treatment that were put on the wait list in October of 2015. This is more than two and a half years ago. This is a lifetime for the eight hundred children on the wait list in Sudbury. Can the minister explain what action he will take so that Lil June and the 800 other kids on the wait list get the treatment that they need in a timely fashion? Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, if the, uh, the member opposite wants to see evidence, she just needs to go and talk to the people of Ontario. We've gone right across the province. We've held town halls. We've spoken to people. It's the NDP that says they'll do two things. Number one, they'll rip, rip the program apart and start new, which is a shame because parents like where, we at, where we're at today. The other thing the NDP is committed to doing is not supporting direct funding. We have made a significant change in this. For the first time in the history of Ontario, direct funding will be applied to parents so they can have the choice. It's about building confidence and choice in the system. And not to mention the Conservatives. We know where their leader stands because he doesn't believe the kids should be, sit be living on the streets with them. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, back in 2003, our urban communities were sprawling at a dangerous rate. Every year, tens of thousands of acres of farmland, wildland, and wetlands, including ravines and rivers, were being encroached by new development. Ontarians were rightfully concerned for economic and environmental reasons. The great majority of people, including residents from my riding of Davenport, agree that to keep our communities livable, we cannot 
cannot pave over the, every square inch of farmland and wetlands in Ontario. Right. That's why we promised every them we would take inch. action, and we did. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how we are taking further action to protect the green belt? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Davenport uh, for that uh, very important question. You know, uh, as the Premier said yesterday, Speaker, we're committed to expanding the green belt to protect to protect even more of our natural environment from development. Speaker, we're expanding and protecting the green belt so our kids and grandkids never have to worry about being able to enjoy or access nature. You know, Speaker, uh, meanwhile, Doug Ford, he made a private deal to develop the green belt to help rich developers get even richer. Doug Ford has confessed on tape to having already talked to some of the biggest developers in the country and offered to give them Greenbelt lands. Now Doug Ford and the PCs are backing away from that decision, but you know, they can't be trusted to protect our Greenbelt lands, Mr. Speaker. We can't take a chance, Speaker. Once the Greenbelt is gone, the Greenbelt is gone. Speaker, our government created the Greenbelt to ensure that Ontario yes, has sir. protected green land and clean drinking water for generations to come. We're committed to protecting it. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for that answer. Speaker, our government created the largest permanent green belt anywhere in the world that protects nearly 2 million acres of valuable land and water. And last year, we expanded the green belt. We protected an additional 10,000 hectares. That's the equivalent of, all, of almost 20,000 new football fields that has been protected. Wow. And residents awesome. from across Davenport sent me emails to thank our Premier and thank our government for for this. Our new expansion includes 21 new urban river valleys and wetlands wow. that connect to Lake Ontario. Fishable We've water. also extended green belt-like protections for natural heritage, water and agriculture to the entire Greater Golden Horseshoe area. This further ensures that sensitive lands are protected for generations to come without constraining development. Meanwhile, Doug Ford and the PCs have flip-flopped on the issue, proving they're willing to say anything to get elected. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how we're continuing to protect the Green Belt for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again to the member from Davenport for another very important question. Speaker, it's clearer than ever that Doug Ford cannot be trusted to protect the Green Belt or the environment. If his secret deal with developers hadn't been exposed, does anyone believe he would have backed off? It, it makes you wonder, Speaker, what other promises have been made in private? To whom? And in exchange for what? Paving the green belt, selling cannabis in corner stores, ending rent control? These are the promises that Doug Ford makes when he thinks voters aren't around to hear him. That's the real Doug Ford, Speaker. He's not backing down. He's backing off. But if he gets elected, watch out. We know who Doug Ford is, and we know who he will stand up for. And, Speaker, it is not the little guy. I'm sure you are. <laughs> New question. The member from Halliburton, Cape Lake Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. One out of every eight Canadian women is being diagnosed with breast cancer, and 30 per cent of all breast cancers become metastatic. Luckily, there are treatments available that help to keep the disease under control and help these women live better, longer lives. Unfortunately, negotiations to get these medications covered by our health care system can go on for over a year without any updates. Patients in desperate need of these drugs are being left in the dark waiting. The cancer does not wait, Mr. Speaker. 
Last year, the ministry said that an announcement to make the process more accountable to patients would be forthcoming. When can we finally expect the announcement from this minister? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, uh, we know that there is great progress made in the treatment of uh, breast cancer, and our government has uh, obviously been very active in this particular area with the Ontario Breast Screening Program, and uh, obviously new and enhanced treatments for patients. In terms of uh, uh, cancer drugs in general, uh, I would remind the, the member opposite that we have an evidence-based uh, system here in Ontario. Uh, we believe that uh, clearly we need medical expertise in terms of effectiveness, uh, side effects, uh, and of course we're part of a national uh, program as well to uh, analyze new and emerging treatments and, uh, and drugs. And so we take this responsibility very seriously. Uh, we have taken the politics out of these decisions, and we will continue to do so. We believe in, obviously, ensuring that uh, we do a thorough analysis and we make our choices based on evidence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. In similar jurisdictions, we see more transparency and more timely benchmarks in the negotiation process, which helps government prepare recommendations to pharmaceutical companies. For example, if the price of a drug is too high or it doesn't meet certain conditions, the negotiators know what needs to change and they get back to the table quickly. Last October, I tabled a petition launched by Rethink Breast Cancer that has since received over 10,000 signatures wow. calling on Ontario to take the lead in fixing this process. So once again, my question to the minister on behalf of the signatories, the breast cancer patients and their families is, what have you done to make the negotiation process accountable, and when are you going to put proper deadlines in place so that Ontario cancer patients get the treatments that they need? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I've said several times in this House, uh, we will continue to uh, analyze data. Uh, we will uh, obviously encourage all uh, the experts that are involved in the processes, whether at the national level or here in Ontario, uh, to do their work in a, an expeditious fashion. When it comes to negotiations, obviously, uh, we will be part of the national system in terms of bulk purchasing, uh, which will have the potential, obviously, to drive uh, costs down. We're on top of the situation, Mr. Speaker. We are working very, very hard in this regard, and I think uh, overall uh, uh, the member opposite and I uh, share uh, the need to move as fast as we can and in the best interests of Ontarians. We are working all the time in the public interest, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Dufferin Aggregates is applying to expand a permit to take water in the Waverly Uplands. This is a critical groundwater recharge area for the Alliston Aquifer. The application is for a huge expansion of the area and depth of excavation. Local residents, including the local First Nations, are opposed to this in the vicinity of what would have been the area of Site 41, an exceptional source of groundwater that was the site of an extensive and ultimately successful fight to protect some of the cleanest groundwater anywhere in Canada. What steps will you take, Minister, to protect this exceptionally clean groundwater? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, what is a very important question. You know, when it comes to uh, protecting the environment and protecting uh, our groundwater sources, we, uh, we do take that exceptionally serious. Our job, our primary job, Speaker, is to protect uh, the environment and protect human health. I know that any time uh, an application comes before my ministry to, uh, to expand or a change in the terms of use, uh, whether it be landfill or aggregates or virtually anything else, uh, there is a very rigorous process that our ministry puts the applicant through. We first set a very rigorous terms of reference, and then we ensure when the applicant comes back that they have met the terms of reference in terms of the information that uh, they have provided us. So, Speaker, when it comes 
comes to this particular project, uh, you can be assured that our ministry is carefully reviewing all of the information that it's been provided, and we will make sure that the health of the environment, the health of humans, is protected. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. The fight to protect groundwater seems to be never-ending in Ontario. Yeah. No sooner are we done with one fight, as we were with the mega quarry at Melanchthon, yeah. than we're confronted with another. Ontario needs a comprehensive groundwater strategy that will protect our groundwater now and for a long time to come. Will the minister put this application on hold until the people of this province have a chance to comprehensively address the whole question of protecting our precious groundwater? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And again, a, a, a good follow-up to the question. You know, Speaker, uh, it touches on a couple of things. You know, we know uh, uh, we know that uh, there is uh, there is real public concern about the taking of uh, groundwater for bottling purposes, for example. Um, and uh, uh, with that in mind, our government put in a moratorium. We put a pause on new permits, on expanding the amount of water being taken from groundwater uh, sources. We also increased the fee to those companies that were taking ground water for bottling purposes and with that funding speaker we've been engaged in doing some real science so that we can make science based decisions moving forward when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, groundwater sources you know but i want to touch speaker for a second i want to touch for a second about groundwater sources because uh, where i come from speaker in my riding Where I come from in my riding, we sit right on top of the Oak Ridges Moraine speaker, which is part of the Green Belt. You may have heard me speak about that in the House just a few minutes ago. The Oak Ridges, Moraine, the Oak Ridges Moraine is the rain barrel of multiple water sources feeding southern Ontario. So I've grown Thank up you. very concerned about this. Thank you. New question, member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Now, we all know that climate change is a real threat, and it's a problem that must be tackled now. And that is why our government has made fighting climate change a priority with our cap-and-trade program that puts a price on carbon. And through the nearly $2 billion we raise annually, we have helped build the fastest-growing clean sec tech sector in Canada, if not North America, with $18.8 billion in revenue, 5,000 companies and 130,000 employees. In fact, since 2003, our government has committed over $740 million to more than 1,600 research and commercialization projects. And I understand that clean tech in Ontario is a diverse sector that includes energy infrastructure, non-carbon generation, and storage. So, Speaker, will the minister inform the members of this House how these investments have contributed to creating an innovative clean tech sector? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from East York Beaches for his advocacy on science and technology. Mr. Speaker, on May the 2nd, I was pleased to speak about the successful recipients of Ontario's Low Carbon Innovation Fund. Through the technology demonstration stream, we are supporting 10 projects, one of which uses artificial intelligence to manage energy storage systems in high-rise buildings. We are also supporting 12 projects through the technology validation stream, including a project to increase wind turbine efficiency and a project that will help absorb atmospheric greenhouse gases. Mr. Speaker, I am very pleased to speak about our government's investments and the work of our researchers, entrepreneurs and the companies in their efforts to create cleaner Ontario. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister. Uh, you know, as a doctoral fellow in physics, this is the, ideally the right person to be reading, leading these programs. Right. Now, it is remarkable to see this government's investments that are helping drive fantastic ideas into game-changing technologies that will improve the quality of life for every Ontarian. Now, we know the PC party, as part of their five-point strategy, they call this corporate welfare, and these, all these programs will be cut, Speaker. 
But we know that these investments are part of Ontario's comprehensive climate change action plan, a plan that aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 15 per cent below 1990 levels by the year 2020. And right in front of our own eyes, we are watching Ontario's clean tech companies invent innovative ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight climate change. They are leaders in creating jobs and focused on creating a whole clean tech sector, part of our carbon-free future, Speaker. Question. So, Minister, Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is our government doing to ensure these successful clean tech companies have the ability to grow and meet global demand for innovative technologies? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you again to the member for that very good question. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, I was excited to announce that Ontario will invest $20 million in the Innovation Growth Fund managed by Yeltham Partners and a $35 million investment commitment to Emerald Technology venture Ventures. These investments, Mr. Speaker, are through the Ontario Capital Growth Corporation, which is the venture capital agency of the Government of Ontario. Here, here. These funds, Mr. Speaker, will help tech firms get the capital they need to grow their businesses and create good jobs in the province of Ontario and to make Ontario companies clean tech leaders. They will create jobs and foster a safer environment for our people. Mr. Speaker, fighting climate change and saving the green belt are not just priorities. It is our duty, Mr. Speaker, to protect our people and our land. Thank you. Thank you. No question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, special needs services for medically, medically complex children and their families are in a state of chaos. Shameful. The Ontario Special Needs Strategy calls for the shifting of these services from one ministry to another, which has created additional red tape, putting at risk hundreds of Ontario families that will not be able to access the care they need. This will completely destabilize the way services are provided. In fact, this decision was so rushed, the government received 325 questions from providers about Unreal. how this is going to unfold. My question is to the minister. Why did the government decide to do this without consulting with providers and parents or taking the time to necessarily think through the implications of this decision to move the services to another ministry? Good Thank question. You. Minister, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're certainly very proud of our special needs uh, strategy. It was uh, initiated, obviously, by uh, uh, members of our government, and uh, we, there was a full and uh, uh, very detailed consultation in terms of looking at the needs of children with these complex uh, medical conditions. I know in my own riding uh, uh, of Oak Ridge's Markham that uh, we're serviced by the Simcoe York Children's Treatment Center. They do exceptional work, uh, but there certainly is a feeling that some uh, coordination with the Ministry of Health uh, is necessary in a number of uh, uh, different ways. In terms of the implementation of the strategy, this is a, a process that is ongoing. There has been considerable uh, recent conversations with Home Care Ontario on this subject, uh, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Good. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Minister. Speaker, existing electronic communications and referral systems that are crucial to service delivery are being scrapped with the promise of recreating other systems from scratch. Therefore, in the meantime, the, the bureaucrats are going to revert to faxes, paper-based records, and manual data entry in the interim. This will take away time from frontline service providers who have to deliver the service to special needs children and will impact the quality Shame. of care. Speaker, will the minister postpone this process until the necessary planning and consultation has taken place? Do the honourable thing, Minister. Minister. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, we as a government recognize that uh, families caring for children uh, with, uh, and youth with special needs uh, face unique uh, challenges. Um, as a government, Mr. Speaker, we're uh, determined to make sure that we can provide the support they need uh, so they can participate at home, at school, and in the community. And that's why in our 2018 budget, Mr. Speaker, which I hope the opposition will be supporting, we announced over $250 million in funding to support children with special needs in our schools. Mr. Speaker, we're a government that believes that we need to invest into young people um, because uh, they're our best, uh, our, our most valuable resource as a society. We need I to agree. make sure that they have the skills and the ability to go forward and Answer. live productive lives. Unlike the Conservatives when they're in power, where they cut 22 per cent for anyone with any form of uh, disability, Shame. it's shameful. And I, and, and they, and they need <laughs> 
Thank you. I can ask the member from Whitby, Oshawa, to come to order. Thank you. No question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, someone we all know very well, Claire Chibot. Thibault. She had to have a second uh, knee surgery in the month of March. When it comes to the services that she was offered uh, at home when she returned home, she decided for a second uh, surgery that she decided that the, the services were in place in order for her to become to uh, stay at home. But what's the problem here is not only that she wasn't uh, offered the services that she needed. Here, this is a quote from the local um, Lynn. No, there are too many files and too many people are being offered services currently. This is absolutely unacceptable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly our home care services are some that we're very proud of. Uh, we intend to uh, make them as seamless as possible in transition post-surgery uh, to the home. And uh, this has been uh, a subject of uh, a great deal of study by individual LINs to ensure that the service is available on discharge and that it's appropriate uh, for the needs of the actual patient. And of course, this is why in our 2018 budget, we're investing some $650 million in home care over the next three That's years, $230 million in this year alone. And, very, and a lot of this funding is going to go for more personal support. So we're funding some additional 1,400 full-time positions. There will be more nursing visits, more therapy visits. Answer. Overall, uh, we know there's more work to do, and we are doing it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Madam Minister, it's been, your government's been in place for the last 15 years, and then when people are call the local LIN, they're being told that there are too many services. That's not an improvement to the service. That's doing less with less. So the question that I'm asking you here today, is this acceptable that someone such as Madame Chabot returns home and she doesn't have the services necessary and that she can't be safe in her home instead of having her be in a hospital context? much, Mr. Speaker. Since uh, we've been in power in the last 15 years, more, we have more than doubled funding for home care. And so, of course, we take this particular area very, very seriously. We know people are living longer, which is a good thing, uh, sometimes with more complex conditions. Uh, we are dedicated to ensuring people have the appropriate care in their homes, and we are taking uh, a multifaceted faceted approach, I would say a very comprehensive approach. We know there's a need for more personal support workers across this province, so we're working with our colleges in terms of the training and uh, making it an entry-level position that will expand further in the future uh, in their career path. We're increasing the training for PSWs, we're making more of them available. We will continue to work in this regard, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we'll work with our LINs to ensure that the appropriate supports are there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? The member from the Topical North. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Priority to invest in a wide range of transit and transportation options. And of course, I know that firsthand because one of the most, the newest rapid transit project, for example, is the billion dollar custom designed Finch West LRT in my own community of Etobicoke North with eight stops, Speaker. Speaker, this will increase GO service across the network, and we're expanding highways and, of course, providing more uh, efficient transportation all around. Time spent commuting, Speaker, as you'll appreciate, means time taken away from family, friends, and our day-to-day -day lives. That's why, of course, we need to make the right investments to get people to their destinations faster and in a more efficient manner. Speaker, it's about getting shovels in the ground to deliver on those investments. My question, Speaker, is this. 
Can the minister please provide an update on our progress to improve commute times across the region, but specifically for people living in my community of Etobicoke North and beyond? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. The speaker, and I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for his ongoing commitment to tackling congestion, which is true, one of the greatest challenges we face in this region. So I was so pleased to be in Vaughan on an absolutely beautiful morning to announce that we now have shovels in the ground on our Highway 427 extension. I couldn't imagine a better person to make this milestone announcement than with our former Minister of Transportation, the MPP for Vaughan, the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. For this project, the highway will be extended by 6.6 kilometres from Highway 7 to Major Mackenzie Drive and widened to eight lanes from Finch Avenue to Highway 7. This is a $616 million investment that will help people get moving. Businesses in Etobicoke, York Region and Peel Region will continue to move. It's all part of our government's plan to support people in their everyday lives by helping you spend less time in your car, more time with the people who matter most, and I look forward to uh, giving more details in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, uh, to the Minister as well as for commitment. I have to say, Speaker, with the eight stops, as I said, custom designed from Humber College to uh, Islington, some of my colleagues are wishing that kind of transportation infrastructure was uh, in their own writing. I'm detecting a little bit of stop envy. <laughs> Speaker, uh, I know that commuters in York Region, Peel, and those coming from further south in Tobacco, uh, this, these sorts of investments make it easier for us to participate in events, see our family, and free up time from commuting. Speaker, while our government has made record investments in transit, some, of course, are still concerned about the impact that longer highways and commutes can have on our environment. Speaker, at the same time, we have to rely on that highway network for our transportation needs. I, of course, agree that we need to make the right choices in the right places. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the 427 extension in my own riding beyond is part of a balanced plan to reduce congestion while also helping to shift Question. people away from their commuting patterns by car? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to again thank the member from Etobicoke North, and he's absolutely correct. This is an important balance that we really need to strike. The health of our region is depending on it. In York Region, for example, we've continued to build up transit options, including the opening of the new Line 1 subway extension to Vaughan and introducing all-day service during the week and new weekend service on the Barry Go Line. But we also know many commuters still rely on their cars for a variety of reasons, and that's why projects like the $616 million Highway 427 extension is so important, but also why we need to be making the right choices when we're planning these projects. To that end, I'm pleased to say that the high occupancy toll lanes will also be installed on Highway 427 in both directions for a total length of approximately 15 and a half kilometres. These lanes are important. They encourage people to carpool, help manage congestion, and provide more options to travellers. Speaker, having shovels in the ground on this critical highway extension will support thousands Answer. of jobs on an annual basis and an incredible step forward. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thornhill. Children and Youth Services. In 2016, 22 privacy breaches were reported to the Ministry of Children and Youth Services with regards to child welfare cases. This past February, two CAS agencies were victims of ransomware attacks. In both cases, thousands of dollars were paid out to cyber criminals. The government was warned that cybersecurity must be a priority for children's aid societies and that funding had to be allocated to protect sensitive information. Mr. Speaker, this minister mandated CAS agencies to upload their data to CPIN, which puts them at risk of security breaches. Will the minister tell us what police agencies were brought in to investigate the hacking of Ontario's residents' sensitive information? Question. Thank you. Minister of Human Resources. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you uh, to the member opposite for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we brought forward the most comprehensive piece of uh, legislation for child protection in the history of this province. This time, the member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, this piece of legislation uh, did a lot to change the way in which uh, uh, child protection is delivered in the province, including uh, the way in which we collect 
and the way in which we hold these organizations accountable. Mr. Speaker, um, the party opposite decided to vote against Bill 89 which included very comprehensive Answer. pieces of information. And in the supplemental, supplement, I'd like to talk a bit about Bill 89 Thank and you. why the Conservatives voted against it. Supplementary. Again to the Minister. The Ministry is on record promising that CEPIN has an IT audit log on file for each case to monitor who is accessing the file. Jane Kovarnikova, president of the Child Welfare Pact, recently asked a ministry welfare agency for the login data of who was accessing her file. The response from a CPIN manager at the ministry was that searches on records are actually not tracked. Since data breaches are obviously occurring, and this minister has failed to monitor the whole mess, Will the minister tell us if families have been notified that he may have allowed their private information to be exposed? And I'd appreciate an answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, in Bill 89, it actually lays out, which was proclaimed this week, without the support, obviously, of the Conservatives, the NDP did support the bill, but in that bill, it raised the age of protection, strengthens the right of young people, commits to addressing systemic racism, it commits to culturally appropriate services for Na First Nations, and it looks at ways to hold CASs accountable. Mr. Speaker, the party opposite voted against it. Why? Because one of their candidates, Tanya uh, Granick Allen, walked into their caucus and told them that the Life Coalition would not support it because of the gender identity piece. That party should be ashamed of their position when it comes to protecting our children here in the province of Ontario. You see it, please? You see it, please? It would be a shame that we ended the way in which it's headed. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Kitchener, Ontario has the second highest childcare costs in Ontario, the first being, of course, Toronto. Finding quality, affordable childcare is a game changer for women. The CCPA survey, which studied gender inequality in the country and in this province, found that nearly half of all involuntary female part time workers are in a part time job because they can only find part time childcare. Finding affordable, quality child care in Toronto, in Kitchener, in Hamilton, in Mississauga. It's like winning the lottery if you can find a space that is quality and that is affordable. And for women to try to re-enter the workforce or return to school and better their lives and better their community, <coughs> there are no options, even with this government. Uh, if you find a space and you qualify for a subsidy, the two do not match up in this province. So what I say to this government, after 15 years of failing families, of failing children, of fa failing women, why should anybody believe you when you talk about child care in this budget or in any other budget? Thank you. All right. Minister responsible for early years, child care and education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm really pleased to rise and answer this question, Mr. Speaker, because there's so much we're doing and I really don't know where to start, but let me just start with this. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about what we are doing right now when it comes to ensuring that we are building a solid foundation. So absolutely, when it comes to our childcare, we are investing $2.2 billion over three years that will provide free childcare for preschoolers that will save families an average of $17,000 a year. That's in addition to what we're doing already when it comes to full-day kindergarten. But let me just talk a little bit about the NDP platform, Mr. Speaker. Their platform. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, their platform really does not uh, make sense. It's not fully costed out. It doesn't build a workforce. It doesn't increase spaces. Really, it just makes a lot of promises. So here's what we're doing. We're already on track to create 100,000 more spaces because we know we'll need those yes, spaces in order to be able to deliver free preschool childcare. We're also building a workforce, and we are doing everything we can to create a new yep. wage grid. Thank you. 
Minister of Labour on a point of order. Uh, speaker, on a point of order, I wasn't here at the start. I didn't get to introduce a great individual that's joined us here today. Bob Farkas is from Oakville. He's finished 90 races raising charities at each one of them, Speaker, wow. and he even repelled down a 12-story building to raise money for the Easter Seals in Kitchener. It's Bob Farkas. Over here. Welcome. Minister of Transportation on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to welcome the family of Paige Madeline Buss here. Their aunt and uncle are visiting today from the great riding of Don Valley West. Lisa Mavera and Gary Mavera, her aunt and uncle. Please welcome them to Queen's Park. Thank you. Welcome. A member from Kingston in the Islands on a point of order. Speaker, I would like to extend another warm welcome to, uh, the, to question period today, Danella Olson, who is a lead developer with the IT department. Thank you and welcome thank you. to question period. Welcome. We have a deferred vote on a motion of second reading of Bill 53, an, an act respecting the establishment of minimum government contract wages. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
honourable members, please take your seats. On April 24, 2018, Mr. Flynn moved second reading of Bill 53, an act respecting staffs from the minimum government contract wages. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Domerlin. Mr. Domerlin. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Madame de Rosie. Madame de Rosie. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Song. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jellinek. Madame Jellinek. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Tabbs. Ms. Shamanta. Mr. Shamanta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 68, the nays are zero. He's not watching. This is not the ayes being 68, the nays being zero, I care the motion carried. The bill, deuxième lecture, du projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated May 2, 2018, the bill is ordered for third reading. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services Act 2018 and the Correctional Services and uh, Reintegration Act. Uh, 2018 to make related amendments to other acts to repeal an act and to revoke a regulation. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell. On April 13, 2018, Ms. Albanese moved third reading of Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services Act 2018 and the Correctional Services and Reintegration Act 2018 to make related amendments to other acts to repeal an act and to revoke a regulation. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Charles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosie. Madame de Rosie. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Ms. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Should be song. Should be song. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jellin. Madame Jellin. Mr. Spike. Mr. Spike. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Ms. Shamanta. Mr. Shamanta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. 
All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. The ayes are 56, the nays are 13. The ayes being 56, the nays being 13, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.